Okay, so week five, guys. Welcome. My God, time is flying, and I hope you guys are having fun. It's midway through this little trip of ours that we're taking. Okay, it is a trip. Okay, it's a trip. Hope you guys are enjoying the journey. Um, certainly, I am. It's been wonderful to just engage with you all and see the change that's taking place. So keep that to yourself. Some of you may be thinking, oh, I should be further along, but it's that change you should be paying attention to that you've made so far, right? It's really not a race, like you're racing against somebody else. It's, it's your path, okay? So um, don't be so hard on yourself because I know I've been there, definitely <laughs> been harder on myself than I, than I need to be. Um, so today we are joined by a guest. So this remaining set of weeks, we're going to get some interesting people joining us for our conversations and brainstorming. Uh, Claire Bosovitsky is here with us. So she is a resident sort of expert, guru, you name it at SAI. And she does so many things that I, I will actually almost refrain to tell you what she does um, outside of SAI with the Elder Center and previously with the Elder Center and now with a new um, new journey that she's about to uh, embark on. I'll let you tell her, I'll let you, I'll let her tell you about that. But we're gonna be chatting today really um, about um, content and branding strategy and really just engage in those conversations and utilizing everything we've been talking about so far, right? And seeing the pieces starting to connect because there's a lot of pieces starting to connect. So before I let uh, Claire, um, talk to you all. I wanted to just share some, um, as always, as I always do, just a quick review um, of what I told you to review in the in the curriculum. So, quick reminder: the pitch deck. Don't wait to the last minute to build this. Okay, I've seen fellows that get last week to go. I'm gonna just do them all in one big chunk. The post session in the curriculum has been guiding you, hopefully has been giving you clues as to where you should be at this time. So if I point it out right now, it's around this evaluation traction area, okay? I will do a quick snippet video on traction, um, although it's, it is described in the curriculum as to what that is, but this is the part where you should be at least, and if you're not, it's okay, don't worry, all right? The midway through, plenty of time left, just don't let it you know, linger for too, long, too much longer. Okay, and you have, you're building logic models, so a lot of the content you already have as well. So this is our journey. We've been taking a tour around the problem area, what you wanna do, outcome outputs, and then the remaining weeks, we're gonna get into these inputs and activities, okay? A lot of times now we're gonna get into that, how that connects then to the outputs and outcomes that are over here, right? The things you're doing, what components you're using. I shared with you that one slide of SAI is sort of all the pieces that are connecting. And Claire, I'm sure if you, you took a look at it, there's so much stuff actually that's not even in there that we, we did, we've just been adding, right? And actually doesn't fit anymore. But uh, we'll be talking about that in the remaining weeks about some of the tools that we're using, some tools we tried and didn't work out so well. So we'll get into that. And th there's a lot. Um, that's why it's, it's kind of carefully, <laughs> slowly introducing it to you all. And this is what I'm talking about, right? And I won't go over it now, but just, just want to put this in the back of your mind, okay? And then high-level highlights, you know, talking today, you know, all these are questions that I think we can dig into um, uh, as, as Claire kind of leads us through this, this discussion. Um, I wanted to leave you with one, one of the central ideas that as we begin to talk about uh, branding and the other components of your initiative that you're building, the idea that in the center here, that the more you serve, the more you grow, okay? And we've been dealing with all these questions separately, right? Who's your audience? Who do you serve? You can, you can, you can reframe it and say, who do you serve, right? How do you serve them? Where do you serve, where do you serve them, right? So if you forget everything for this week, it's this idea of serving, right, others. Um, that has been a guiding feature um, for SAI. And as Claire knows, I'm always asking, so how does this help the residents, right? How does this help the fellows, you guys? How does this help the interns? That's what drives us um, as we move forward. Um, and so with that, I wanted to just open the floor to Claire and, and really just let her tell her story in 
communication and, and talking about content, how do you use content and how do you talk to people broadly? How do you communicate that branding, right? Because you are going to, all of you are going to want to communicate what you're doing, how you're doing it and to whom. And I think it's how better else than to hear from someone who actually has done that for other organizations, for herself, and now doing it with us here at SAI and helping us tell our stories and and coordinating and connecting all the pieces. So, so this is going to be a conversation. Um, Claire has some slides, but we, we, it will be a conversation. So Claire, welcome. It's always wonderful to have you. Yay, thank you so much. I'm trying to get my slideshow up and going. Oh, I should give you access. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, okay, Lino's stuck out there. Whoops. Do it because there are a couple of notes that I want or that I need to. So I want to make sure that I share the right screen with everyone as well. Maybe, maybe not. And I just want to say hi, Kayleen. Sorry, I, I may have uh, left you in the waiting room for a little while longer <laughs> by accident. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Hi. <laughs> you didn't miss much. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll go with this way. All right. Maybe, maybe not. I'm using, okay, full disclosure, I'm using my work computer in which I have not been in the office long enough to know how to use this computer. So that's where I am running it to. Here we go. Technical difficulties. All right, so make sure I can, there you all are. Perfect, yay. So yes, thank you so much, Fangwell, for letting me crash the fellows party that we've got going on this week. I'm super excited to talk with you all today just about content strategy, science communication, branding. Um, at any point during this kind of presentation, quote unquote, feel free to just drop in. Um, with questions, uh, I, I will try to monitor um, everybody's like photo or video screens up above, um, but feel free to just unmute yourself, just start talking. Um, I will eventually hear you and stop talking uh, myself. Um, the one thing I do want to ask is that everybody either has a pen, pencil, and paper next to them or has a screen up on the side where they can kind of take notes. Um, this will be an interactive session. Um, I, and I'll, I'll get to more of that in a second and why um, I believe interaction is best in presentations. Um, maybe if I will. So quick kind of overview and roadmap for everybody today. Um, I'll first go by and kind of just share who I am, my um, story and how I got into the field of science communication and content and um, all this, all that jazz. Uh, we'll talk about communication strategy more broadly. I'll show you and walk you through a couple examples, and then we'll kind of go into that Q&A portion together. Um, and so I want to start off with this quote because it really just, as I've, I've moved through the field, um, both in science and then science communication, this is really kind of is what sticks out to me. And that um, it's from Jensen and Gerber. Um, and it says, ironically, perhaps the greatest challenge facing the field of science communication is the lack of commu effective communication. And that really puts into perspective just how important it is to not only communicate science effectively, but to communicate about science and science communication more broadly effectively. And this translates too into science outreach um, and especially the projects that you all are working on today. And so effective communication is key. Um, and the way kind of that I got into this, um, yes, there's me on the screen, the cringe slide that always comes up. Um, I started at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I received uh, my degrees in life sciences communication. Um, and while I was there, I conducted research on uh, public attitudes towards regulations surrounding, surrounding human gene editing um, regulation formation. Um, so breaking that down, what the heck does that mean? Basically, I looked at um, different stakeholder groups and their opinions regarding who they want involved, who they want and who they don't want involved in regulation and policy formation surrounding human genome editing. 
um, along with public engagement with science, um, controversial science, uh, decision making, um, broadly speaking, um, as well. And part of my job there while I was in graduate school is I was a um, communications assistant for the department that I was studying in. And so a lot of what I've learned in terms of social media, branding, content strategy comes from that position in itself in which that has led me then to the current positions that I hold both um, with SAI as the, I started as the communications officer and um, last November became the assistant director of operations. So work side by side with Manuel, just about kind of our larger community, making sure that everybody and everything is kind of in check um, and just thinking about how we can expand our community um, more broadly and then my daytime job um, is at with the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science um, at Stony Brook University. And so that is really where I, I train scientists to be better communicators. Um, we do a lot of interactive sessions with um, scientists and groups all over, um, name drop NASA, Microsoft, um, EPA, uh, all phew, so many different people um, and different, and it's all about just getting scientists. We combined improv with communication strategies, and it's about getting scientists to feel comfortable speaking in front of any different, any type of audience and ensuring that they are prepared and know who they're um, talking to. Um, but then I also more recently have new, taken a new job with the EPA itself, and my job is uh, taking the research that's being done at the EPA and helping translate it up for Congress and APA leadership to make more informed decisions um, revolving uh, environmental and health uh, policy. And so um, that's kind of where I, I, ro I, I roam in kind of these realms of uh, research to practice, science communication training, part of the science communication trainers network in itself, um, as well as just helping others find kind of their space in science communication and science more broadly. Um, and so I'm super excited and thrilled to be able to just chat with you all today about kind of how to share about your projects when it comes to um, kind of once you once you make your way through the fellows program and you're out in the, the lonely and cold science world, um, just how to keep kind of that warm and that, um, that, pain, that passion and that flame going. Um, because again, communication is important, uh, even though it's overlooked all the time. And so today, um, kind of walk you through the five steps, five steps-ish um, of just building out a communication strategy. And they are really, really simple. And that the first is that you need to know, okay, who, why, who, my computer, what, where, and when. That's really, if you just keep those five, those five W's, the why, the who, the what, the where, and the when, when you're building out your communication strategy in mind. And we'll break this down uh, one by one as we go here. But if you, keeping these in mind is, it really helps you think about just the larger of why you're communicating your work, who you're communicating with, what you're communicating, where you're doing it, and then when as well. And so jumping into the why um, and thinking about just this general question of why do we communicate and really what is our aim of communication? And this is different for everybody and every project and every endeavor that occurs within the field. Um, Speaking like in regard to SAI work, um, just why do we communicate about the stuff that's going on? Well, we have a multitude of goals that we want to accomplish. We want to gain more people and more eyes upon our programs. We want funding. We need funding. Um, how we go about this, what our aim is, and that just all depends on the goal. And so really kind of this why I would expand out into kind of a goal and agenda setting. Um, and one of the things too, when, when we have this term of, okay, why do you communicate? A lot of people and a lot of experts will immediately tell me, turn around and say, oh, I want to inform. I want to inform people about the work that I'm doing. I want to inform people about the projects that I have um, going on or 
things like that, and which is great. But information, just just trying to get somebody to be more informed, it, it's a tough it, it's a tough street and a tough like uphill battle to go by. Um, because in the world of communication, we have this theory. It's called the um, knowledge deficit model, and that the more just knowledge that you spew at somebody or the person that you're communicating with it's not going to make them change their mind or change their opinion or get them to act in another way. You're just simply giving them more information. Um, and so there are other models and other ways of engagement in which I would recommend that you try to inspire, instead of just strictly informing, you try to inspire some type of trust within this audience or create a connection with somebody that you're speaking with. Um, and you can do this in by telling a story. Um, and this storytelling is huge, especially, and it will be a huge tool, especially for your all, y'all's um, communication tool belts. Um, when you think about just your projects and the story behind your project and why it's such an important endeavor. Um, and the ability to convey emotion throughout just these communications that you're, um, that you're having with people face-to-face, face to screen to screen to face um, online, or I mean, just email, you name it. The more you can kind of dig deep and bring up the, uh, the underlying, the sur instead of going just at surface level, level um, is phenomenal. Um, but really this ultimately kind of what you want to do is you really wanna make yourself known with your target audience. Um, and kind of thinking about this in a way you and the point that we're all at right now is you just want you want eyes on your work you want to become visible with the community um, or a stakeholder group that you are passionate about um, learn either engaging with learning more about you name it um, and so really tapping into different things and thinking about the goals that you have the larger communication goals um, will be helpful and useful as you work and so um a way to kind of think about and goal setting um, and use is, I mean, the larger field of science communication. Uh, we there, it, it meets different goals and objectives in terms of increasing visibility, getting funding, developing partnerships, um, giving assurance and reassurance to misunderstood or mistreated um, audiences or underrepresented audience audiences. Um, and then also, I, I will throw in that it does, there is still a key portion of informing. And so you, you can't necessarily just um, go out and try to make connection and make relations with other um, individuals without some, forming, some form of informing. Um, it just can't be that information that here's my flyer, here's my pamphlet, read it and get to know all about me type thing will be, it's not the main strategy that I want you all to use. Um, and so taking a pause on the why, going to jump to the next W, which is the who, um, and thinking about your target audiences or target audience slash target audiences, because there are multiple people in which you will be communicating about your projects with, um, starting from Fanwell to your um, project, to your mentors, um, all the way up to potential funders or participants, uh, people who will be involved in your project um, and who will be kind of the ones receiving your work. Uh, communication is a two-way street. And so you have to really shift the focus away from you and your work and put it more on them and get to know who you're communicating with. Um, and so I wanna take a brief pause. And if we want to either use the chat um, to throw these out, or if you want to take it or unmute yourselves, completely up to you. I want to know who you who you feel are your target is your target audience or potential sub audiences. Um, these could be again potential your peers that you're working with, um, funders, journalists, uh, and I'm going to ask that we refrain from using the term general public because there is not a general public. Um, there are mul multiple publics with an S, uh, plural. And so no, no two people are similar. And so let's maybe do a little brainstorming quick together and see what we can come up with.
Ooh, so I see, yes, perfect. Um, can you name primary, small, medium news organizations, science communicators, primary school students in Jamaica? Love it, oh my gosh. We were just talking about warm weather before. Latino biomedical engineers in graduate school. I love the specificity that you have on that. Um, that is super important. And the more, again, the more narrow, the more you can define your audience, the better. Uh, STEM educators, sub audiences, teaching audiences, young students, perfect, yes. Young students, um, high school students in South Africa, undergrads in STEM. I love it, I love it. The one that I'm not seeing, and I know that we all will have experience with or will engage in some type of way, are funders or grant um, people. So that's also something to think about as we all, unless y'all are just sitting on piles of money, because then I want to know how you got that. Um, yeah, and, and let me just add here that, so all of you are doing this wonderful thing where you're pulling from your logic models, you know? I, I, I'm seeing what you're doing. Yeah? Very good, very good, very good. But also something to think about, as Claire mentioned, right? Funders, when you, when you think about content, you can think about your primary target, like your actual, I'm trying to impact these people. But also, I want to be able to communicate what I'm doing right here to these other stakeholders, right? And that's where the who is really important. You got to think about, okay, locally in my program, I'm, I'm communicating and I'm working with these people but also I need to communicate what I'm doing and the impact to these other people. Then the question is, how do I do that? When do I do that, right? So it becomes, you need to think multi-levels um, as well. Definitely, yes. Thank you, Pamela, that's, yeah, perfect. Uh, this is everybody, every, this kind of jumps back to the what or what, why? There we go, why, I'm getting confused with my Ws. Um, every strategy that you have per your target audience will have a different why or a different goal um and how you accomplish that is also a different will enable different paths and so um this is kind of where that the pen and pencil paper document comes into play um i want everybody to pick one of their target audiences or a sub audience that they have and i want you to pick the one maybe that you're less familiar with um just to gain some experience and just thinking about kind of getting to getting in this audience and that the mindset that they have and so first what i want us to do is to really just think about who is that audience um and really flesh it out who are they what do they know and what do they value so i'll give you i'm going to sit in silence for a minute minute and a half and let you kind of just think about this and ponder and write down what you all believe. Um, excuse me, hi. Uh, so this would be like funders and people who aren't our like primary target audience. Okay. This can be, it, yep, this can definitely be them if you, that's the audience that you wanna pick right now. Um, or if you wanna pick, um, like I see your high school students in South Africa, if you wanna focus on that audience right now, go for it. Um, completely up to you but don't be afraid to think outside the box slightly because all of you are going to have networks of audiences right so if for Cineseca, for example your your primary students you're trying to get in touch with them but also thinking about the radio stations that could be part of the stakeholders right think about the stakeholders in your network right the primary audience is part of that network yes but they're not the only ones and so when you start using things like social media and everything, you, you have to be strategic about, okay, what am I, who am I trying to communicate this information, right? And why, right? To, to Claire's point, why? I want, fund, I want funders to know what I'm doing so that they can give me money yes. or they know what I'm doing so that they can collaborate with me, right? You see, you have these sub goals that you can break down and be strategic about them. Then as we're thinking, I'm going to have another kind of speaking of goals, thinking about instead of the goals for you and yourself and your communication, um, oh, typo there. Um, what are the goals for your audience? Um, and what goals do you have for them coming out of a communication that you, um, a, a conversation maybe that you have with them or a social post that they read? 
um, basically you really you want to think down you want to think in um, about in the context of what do you want your audience to think feel or do after your talk um, or again insert any type of communication in that space and so again thinking about the goals that you have for your audience do you want them to engage with your project do you want them to buy um sign up for your training session do you want them to buy a kit for science um, i'll leave that there This is part of that in your logic model, the communication portal, like the communication, not communication, the activity, sorry, block. This is where it will be a thing that you're doing and say, okay, I want to be able to communicate what I'm doing to these people so that they know, right? Funders or other stakeholders more broadly, right? So don't be stuck on your primary audience. That's almost the easy one actually to do, right? Because you can you have them trapped somewhere, my my podcast listeners, but Venture out a little bit, right? Stretch those muscles. I know you can do it. And I like this the suggestion too that's up here. Um, I must also think about the parents and teachers as sub audiences. Parents are a huge sub audience. Teachers, educators, huge sub audience um, to think about. And so, what in that stance? What are what are their goals? What do, what are what drives them? Um, and what what do you want them then to think, feel, or do? after you talk with them about your work. Um, and also thinking along that lines, why, why do they care? Why should they care? Um, what, what goals do you think that they have after coming out of speaking with you or communicating with you in their project? Um, basically, it's kind of that whole thought of like, oh, what's in it for them type deal. And so you wanna make sure that you have that very clear um, kind of in your mind as you're walking through this. jump to the next one. I apologize if I'm moving quick. I'm keeping an eye on the time and I want to make sure we're able to get to everything together too. And I can always get back to stuff. Um, slash I'll, I can share these slides out at the end um, as well. Uh, but something that's important to think about too as you're thinking about your target audiences are what are the obstacles that might come up um, in when you're trying to communicate with them um, and kind of the, the thought of what's in the way of achieving your goal. Um, at, and this is something where you really have to think about the identities that you hold as an individual as well, and the audiences and the communities that you're serving. And so um, speaking uh, from personal experience as a white female, there are some audiences that I'm, the not, I'm not the best messenger for my communications that I'm trying to get out. Um, there, are certain, there are certain content, certain strategies that come as a, as a white female, if it comes across um, it can come across in a certain way to certain people. And so I have to be very cognizant and very aware. Um, and I also have to rely on um, kind of other people around me, which leads into this next point of how do you achieve that goal based on kind of the obstacles that are in that way? Do you call upon other people to help you out? Do you pick different mediums to communicate your work on? Um, thinking about this larger context and larger strategy of communication that you can use. Um, and taking a minute to think about the obstacles um, really are important. Um, it might be language barriers. Uh, it might be a kind of global context of what's going on um, around them or things like that. Um, slash it, it might just be I mean, funding, lack of funding is always some, something that comes up. Um, not only for the projects that you have, but also the people that you're in the communities that you're serving. Um, trying to think of other examples too. Of course, this is with the time of day that my brain shuts down, so we'll get through this. <laughs> and so, oh my, so then I head to slides. And so, yes, thinking, keeping kind of this idea of okay, 
how am I going to get back to my why? How am I going to achieve my why with my goal in mind? And what strategies can I use here? Will be kind of what I want you to keep in mind as you're going. And thinking kind of of the what, um, that's really the message design of uh, the strategy portion of what you want to relay to your audience, to your target audience and sub audiences. Um, this is kind of the moment where you really need to reflect on the west, the what you wish to convey to your audience, which or back to Fanwell's point earlier about creating your pitches um, early is fantastic because the more time you have to sit with a message, the more time you have to think about how your audiences will receive it, um, anything that would come up. Um, waiting to the last minute kind of, it provides you like a tunnel vision. You're not able to see really what's going on externally around you and think about other ways that you can do, how you can uh, convey what you wish to communicate with your audience. And so it, it's really kind of a matter of taking a step back, looking at the message that you're trying to convey and thinking about, okay, does it achieve the goal that I have? Does it achieve the goal that my audience might have coming into this? Um, is this message effective in thinking about how, what I'm trying to convey um, type of realm? And so something to think about as well is, um, especially when it comes to your audience, is just how much they know about the topic that you're trying to communicate with. Um, if you're communicating about your project and your project is very specified in like, stem cell research and getting young middle schoolers involved in stem cell research of some sort um, and talking about all these like jargony terms. Maybe it's some time for you to kind of step back and think about, okay, how can I convey this to them in a simple, clear, concise manner that enables your audience to feel empowered as you're speaking with them. Um, Clear and conciseness takes you far in communication. Uh, a lot of times, especially in as scientists and trained experts, we want to just throw all these fancy dance, fancy terms at people and really show that we're the experts in this. Um, and that's not why I encourage you to take other paths, especially when you're trying to get um, different stakeholders to engage with you, because just Sometimes giving a message in a sentence or two is better than giving them a whole page or paragraph um, of context and background and details. Um, and just really thinking about like kind of hooking them in and drawing them in. So clear, concise, effective by all means. Um, and when we think about kind of the messages that we want to convey um, and going back to this idea of how, how we communicate as, as scientists and trained, trained experts, how we communicate. We're taught to talk uh, speak about the background first of our work, um, go into some supporting details, and then the results and conclusions that we have. Um, and this is just, this the structure is a, is a cultural norm for scientists. Um, but when we think about kind of how other potential stakeholders want to receive information, uh, there's kind of, when you think about another um, branch, with, um, we think about in this case, publics, uh, the publics really just want to receive the bottom line first. They want to know what you're trying to communicate with them and moving into the next point, why they should care. So why, so what, why should I care about this? Um, and then that's when you kind of branch out into the supporting details and, um, this is something that we talk about a lot at the Alda Center, um, where we try to get scientists to shift from this thinking of defining and narrowing to just giving your audiences the information at face value flat out. I'm here to get young girls involved in STEM through my program, blah, blah, blah. Why this is important is because of, there's a lack of, there's a lack of females in STEM. And so and mentorship is important in the STEM community, especially for females. And so um, by maintaining, kind of having, seeing other, getting young girls involved in STEM early on, there's a deep research shows that it, they're going to remain in STEM for longer periods of time. And if I connect them with a, another, if I connect a one female with another female mentor, identifying mentor, then 
there's a larger chance that they're going to remain in the STEM field and continue in a career that they um, love and um, want to continue in. And so that's kind of where it's that um, example kind of fits in. It's the bottom line first, why they should care, and then the supporting details come in later on. Um, and when it comes to as well shaping kind of this what or the message that you have, when you think about shaping the message, um, again, keeping in mind the audience that you are trying to communicate with and the goal that you have in communication. Um, I'd like maybe if we can think about this um, and do another little exercise together um, that involves the chat. In the first thing that um, thinking about your message is getting that, that hook. Okay, what draws attention? What would you communicate with um, another, with you, the audience that you chose? What's the first thing that you would say to them aside from introducing yourself and kind of go, that like post 30 seconds after your elevator pitch? Um, what's that hook? What's that attention grabber? And this is going to happen, right? You're going to be on a call with a funder and they have like 10 minutes, yeah. right? You can't give a whole spiel about, you know, everything that's happening in the world. It's going to be straight to the point, right? Um, or you're going to talk to a, a potential new team member whom you're trying to recruit to your team, right? So th this is going to play out multiple ways as you guys do this in the future. So uh, especially this. <laughs> Thinking about social media, I mean, Twitter, you get 280 characters. You, that's not a lot to give a whole big presentation style. You have 280 characters to grab the attention of some random person floating in the Twitterverse. Um, if anybody has any kind of ideas that they're for you, that they're kind of like working up, feel free to throw those in the chat. Or unmute and you can kind of workshop this with the larger group. So, um, so maybe um, I could ask them, how does like science apply to your everyday life? <laughs> Yeah. By all means, yeah, of course, you can, yeah, by just saying, I mean, knowing very little about your project and things, yeah, it's just, so, in what ways do you experience science in the world? And just asking a question is a great way to get people thinking um, and kind of get their wheels turning, and it's also, it, it grabs their attention, you're, you're taking the, you're shifting the focus off of you and putting it onto them. And ensuring like that you you're building trust in a sense too that you care about the answer that they're going to give because it's there are no wrong answers especially to that question um oh okay maybe there are but there are ways that you can kind of pivot it in a sense too and i like the way you said it you said how do you experience science in your everyday yeah oh yeah Thank you. Of course. Any other ideas? Jump then to the second, which is that the bottom line that we're thinking about too, thinking about that pyramid in itself. So you hook your audience and then, um, especially when it comes to your projects, it's a matter, it's kind of an opportunity for you to share your passion um, and give them that bottom line first. Um, and it's, it's not in the sense of, oh, I'm Claire and I'm passionate about effective science communication. Um, it's, it's more, it's kind of, it's helping like lead your audience to the work that you're doing. Um, so in the example that I was talking about in getting young girls involved in STEM, um, it's, and it's a matter of, there's a huge gender gap um, in the STEM field. And so by um, one of the passions that I have is that I would like to mentor 
and become a leader, a female, a strong female leader for other um, females in this community and in this world. And so that, um, the, and hopefully that they're able to share and have many of the same experiences or similar experiences and opportunities that I was blessed to give. Um, and so it's kind of, it's walking that tight line between giving the, again, giving the bottom line, but showcasing the passion that you have. Uh, and this is especially helpful then for funders. And if you can try to get your audience to kind of share, this is where the thinking about the who, thinking about the values that they have um, and showcasing their values. It, it's, I, I'm val or I, I value public safety and I value um, public health. Um, and I, I value your, your child's um, health. And so I, I love if, if your child is a vaccine, like thinking about vaccines, children giving children vaccines and parents. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm passionate about making sure that your child stays and remains healthy. Um, and vaccines are a way that, we, that, that can be accomplished. Um, and so then leading into kind of this third thing too is, is highlighting the relevance with any audience, giving them that so what, just flat out. It's okay. I, I've hooked you in. I've shared the passion that I have. Why should you care? Why should you get involved? Why should you like this tweet? Why should you buy this product that I have going? Um, thinking about it in that context. Why you should follow our Twitter. Yes. Right? yes. Why you should sign up to our mailing list. You see how this now permeates pretty much everything you do. I love what's coming into the chat right now too. Um, I'm guessing for this, Kayleen, for this, um, the second one is, wouldn't it be cool to be able to see the whole body of research on a health question in one visual? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, the more you can kind of like lean somebody into like, oh yeah, that would be cool if this was an option that I have. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the next one too, it's navigating for parents, especially navigating life is hard. Um, don't you want to equip your child with the skills and success that they need to navigate life and be successful? What parent would not say yes to that? Um, what parent doesn't want to support their children and their endeavors? And so it, it's kind of that it's like leading, leading, kind of leading somebody to the watering hole. Like, oh yes, come, come, come with me. Come down this path. Let me let me show you what's going on in the thirty seconds that I have to speak with you, or five minutes that I have. Uh, 10 minutes. Wow, that's generous, Manuel. That's a, that's a long phone call with the funder, I will say. <laughs> um, and so thinking about these in the sense of your goals that you have, the audiences that you're communicating with, and the messages that you're trying, trying to craft, um, the next thing that I want us all to think about, too, is where you'll be disseminating those messages um, and what means that you'll be using to communicate. And so one of the, there are so many at this point in time, so many options for communication and different avenues for content to go out on, on online, in person, uh, you name it. And so there's, you, there are places kind of where you can get sucked down a communication hole and spend a lot of time, effort, and money. Um, and so I, I want you to kind of think about in, 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 in the sense of, um, instead of trying to spread yourself super thin and wear yourself down and limit the resources and time that you have, um, focus on places that um, are uh, like that can easily adapt to the audiences that you're serving and the goals and objectives that you have. Um, and so, thinking about kind of just the world of communication and content um, uh, online right now, do you have you? Has everyone thought about kind of what places they would be reach, reaching out to audiences or, or what places their audiences that their target audiences are kind of alive on and using? Um, websites, social media, any, anybody do a little bit of research and background, know their audience so well already that they can answer this? Yes. Twitter, Slack, newsletter, Instagram, love it. It seems like um, for me, I get more responses and stuff on LinkedIn a lot of times because it's like seems like less competitive or so. I don't know. Like you have to fight through less, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 
by all means, um, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. And back to your point too, the Kayleen, the, so every social media platform is different and there are different audiences that it connects with too. And so, um, Ooh, I love this, this answer to a radio, um, which is huge, especially in South Africa. Oh, we got a chat. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of thinking about it in the sense of where your audiences already are. Cause why, why create more work for yourself here? Um, and so, yeah, LinkedIn might be kind of the place that the, where you're getting, like you said, where you're getting more responses because more of your audiences are living in that community compared to Instagram or TikTok or um, Slack. I, it, it all really just, it depends. Um, but th keeping this in mind, I do encourage that everybody has a website and what a, an external website that they have about their project um, or even yourself too, um, as grad students, postdocs, you know, young professionals, um, just for you to communicate about your work in which I think y'all are getting training on website design and functionality next week, right, Fanwell? That's right, that's right. We'll, we'll be covering that next week. Um, so with this, I do, I do have to run uh, temporarily right now. So Claire, um, I'll give you host powers, okay? <laughs> Um, I may jump back in. I just have to go and take care of something that's happening downstairs. But um, if you guys are still here when I come back, great. But um, but yeah, continue having great discussion. This is this is this is really good. Um, yes, and so you all will get kind of the website endeavors and showcase next week, um, in which I really I really encourage you to think about if you don't already have one, buy a domain, get a domain, um, and because that is where, again, all information, it's really easy for you to tailor your content um, because it, it's your own platform. You can do whatever the heck you want within reason. Um, and alongside that, um, pick a social media, some type of social media account. Um, and for now, if you're able to just stick with one, if you wanna jump into two, three um, and start targeting kind of different platforms, go for it, but at least get one that you're kind of you're, you're fueling all of your communication time and energy into. Um, and that kind of comes along with uh, another point. The last point that we have of these five W's is determining the frequency in which that you'll communicate with your different audiences. Um, younger programs and younger initiatives, the more that you can communicate with your audiences, kind of the, the better that it picks up in brand recognition and yes, um, and uh, kind of like recency effects. So hence why, I mean, different ads, especially like radio ads, TV ads, they'll try to play them so often and so people will pick up on them and recognize them that more often. Um, and so if you're able to send out daily tweets um, or three, four times a day, okay, four times a day is a lot. Um, but that like a nice kind of morning, evening, morning, afternoon, evening frequency, a couple of days a week, um, just to make sure that you're staying in the know, you're, you're keeping your audience, you're still serving your audience, you're still giving them um, information that they need about your project or connecting them with other people in the field and just making sure that you're staying recent in their heads and that they're remembering you um, more often. And so, but the thing to think and keep in mind as well is that you, you want to be kind of wary of external factors that are going on. Um, <laughs> things do, as we learned in 2020, things don't always go as planned. And so there are times that you'll have to adjust what's your, your communication strategy and the content that you're producing. Uh, just thinking about kind of what's going on in the world and especially thinking about the audience, what your audiences are going through. And so um, tailoring the content to their needs at any given time is extremely important. Um, and in keeping, again, keeping your audience in mind as you're doing this will kind of help just make sure that your audience stays kind of loyal to your brand or your product or your program that you're using and helping them really think about it kind of in a, in a broad context and showing that you care. And you're not just, you're not just concerned about your program success, you're concerned about them just as people and as individuals. Oh, wow, this got super blurry, so I apologize. Um, 
this is kind of just a really nice graphic that I, I like to um, introduce to early content creators. Um, on the one side, um, you have the level of effort from ranging from low effort and um, frequency, the more often that it takes to communication content that is a higher effort and are just, you don't necessarily do as much. And so starting at the bottom of the pyramid, that low effort, but you want to communicate, you want to keep doing um, most often are social media posts, curated content on your website, um, or just keeping your con your website up to date, um, depending on things that change. Um, moving into kind of that fourth, that second to um, the bottom tier of short form, if you're thinking about potentially doing like a blog content, or if you have other people, other product users, um, or other potential like reviews, um, that's a place kind of for you to, it takes a little bit more effort to solicit those and to create that content, um, but it's also something that can be useful for different audiences. So it just kind of depends. Um, all the way up to if you're, if you're going to be speaking with uh, funders and you actually get time to sit down or you're giving a talk on your program that you're having. Um, infographics and slides are something, again, you gotta, you, gotta get a, you gotta give it a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, but it's not something that you're, you won't be doing it as often, um, but you won't be, I mean, hopefully not giving a presentation about your work every single day for six plus months. Um, in the early stages you might, but um, then it kind of moves into, I mean, you can think about kind of like thought leadership things. Uh, if you want to do like a, a white paper or kind of just the impact, an overall report to your funders about the work and the programs that your program has been doing um, and think about it kind of in that larger sense in that larger context. Um, and I'm going to quickly shift gears to and then what I want to walk us through in the time that we have is this idea of this is something that you all can kind of as you're building out your own content strategies for your work um, thinking about this is just a really easy canvas to kind of follow of and thinking about who you're creating that for so up on top you put whatever audience you're trying to target in that sense and breaking it down then from each is different the, oh wow different goals that you're having and so if it's something that you want to increase awareness of the program or brand that you have, great. Do you want to create interest and desire? Um, again, continue to nurture that interest and kind of entice this idea of, it says purchase, but it's just like usage um, of your program or getting anybody involved. And then another idea is just kind of retaining customers or retaining people who use your product and that sense of brand loyalty. A lot of this does come from marketing, so that's why that like customer, product, loyalty, brand um, terminology comes into play. Um, it's it's not sales, but in a sense, there is a little bit of selling involved um, because you're selling yourself, you're selling what you're creating and um, the work that you've been doing. And so um, this kind of the next line is to think about: okay, you have your audience, you have the goals that you just uh, that you've defined for them and for yourself. Um, where are you going to do this on? Are you going to do it on your website? Are you going to pick whatever social media platform that you want? Um, great. Uh, also thinking about the specific types of content. Um, if you're trying to increase brand awareness and you've decided to do a YouTube video, what is that going to look like? Oh, is it just going to be me sitting in a frame talking about my work? Am I going to have a slideshow and do kind of a step-by-step -step tutorial? Um, you've really kind of got to narrow it down a little bit there. And then um, lastly is thinking about the resources that you'll need to create this content. And there are a ton of free resources online. Um, Canva is one of them. There's a ton of different products. Um, Hootsuite is great for social media content managing. Um, really, Planoli. Uh, Sprout, uh, we can talk about kind of specifics of places to go, but um, and even people, I mean, there, there are definitely people out there like myself who are happy to always chat with you about kind of your, how you're communicating about your work and what strategies you're using and if they're actually working. Um, and jumping to kind of the last slide I have here and thinking about kind of a, a plan that you have is, and I want us to really pay attention to this last column. Um, so the first 
through what I'll walk through is just uh, different plans that you have for like owned content. Um, and so for these, these are things like your website, um, an email listserv that you have, any social media, what's going on. Um, the, the next thing is thinking about the strategy in which you'll use, uh, the budget that you have slash the time and effort, like those are resources. And so um, if it's something where you're able to put in an hour in a week here and 30 minutes on social media, great. Um, the outcome that you have, and then this last column is super important with this metrics that you want to look at, because that's really is what's going to tell you if the what the work that you're doing, if it's in, if it's accomplishing what you intended it to. Um, and so it, the metrics depend on what platform you're using um, and the goals that you have. And so if it's something for social media that you want followers and you want your followers to be engaging, looking at your numbers um, in terms of likes, clicks, shares, um, and the people who you follow are great. Um, website is the traffic, how many clicks you're getting, just traffic coming to your website, who's engaging with what content and how long they're engaging with that content are important. Um, and then there are other um, opportunities kind of as you have here, you can do different outreach strategies or working with other people um, and kind of giving that shout out, shout out for shout out str um, strategy that you have. Um, and this just depends the strategy in which you do that. It's it's working with others and because again, y'all aren't alone. Um, you have a whole community, especially here at SAI, who are doing similar people who are doing similar things or partners that you can kind of team up with and say, hey, I'd love to feature the work that you're doing. I'd love to feature your program and write about it. Do you want to they type thing and they're like, yes, and then that makes them more inclined to also feature you um, and the work and the programs that you do. And of course, there's the last one. Um, you can do paid strategy through ads and things like that. But, um, and I, I will be completely honest, um, SAI has never used a paid advertisement of any type. And so there are ways for you to get around kind of that paid promotion. Um, but sometimes they're, depending on the target audience that you have, it's hard to find them and hard to get them to navigate and work with you. And so sometimes paying for running an ad on Facebook for a couple of weeks is helpful. Um, and things. And so if, if you ever get into the paid advertising realm, um, reach out and we can kind of chat together and work through um, kind of that portion of content and strategy and things. Going to quickly jump. I know we went through everything so fast and so I apologize. Um, love to take your questions. Also, I took this presentation at work today and so my cats normally are home with me so I had to find a way to include them in this presentation as well. So there's a picture of my beautiful kitties Winston and Cece. Um, but yes, I'm just going, oh Fanwell's back, perfect. I'm so, back. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what questions can I answer? I know this was fast and so <laughs> by all means I'm here. Go for it, sorry, I was drinking there. Yeah, so um, you just mentioned something about measuring your metrics, uh, that being like engagement rate, clicks and so on. Are there any platforms you're aware of where you can keep track of that stuff? I know on like Instagram, if you have like a, I, I forget what it's called, some sort of account, it like keeps track of things for you. But for things where it doesn't keep track, like what would you advise someone use? I would definitely advise Hootsuite. Um, the analytics portion of Hootsuite is phenomenal in terms of the data that they give. They give you engagement in terms of how many followers. What um, is that? Hootsuite. Um, oh, perfect. Fan, I'll drop a link there. Um, they give you, yeah, your numbers. You can watch, they have really nice graphs. Of, you can watch your followers um, over time. You can watch the engagements that they have. So how many times they're liking, sharing, commenting on a post, um, how many times you have posted in a month. Um, and then also too, depending on the platform, like you said, you can go into like the analytics side and it might be a thing where creating a business page on Facebook might be helpful and worth it because you get that analytical feature or yeah, Instagram. It's like, a, I don't, I can't remember what the account's called, but it's so that like similar um, standpoint. You do lose functionality in the sense that you are then now a business account or a corporate account or something like that. So 
there is kind of that sense, a little hesitation of trust, um, but it, it's worth it to get the analytics behind it too. You, um, you could also create a, um, like a creator account, like a, um, that is a good in between. It's not really a business, but you still get analytics. Um, so you could also do that as well. Perfect. Yes, that account. I was like, what is, what is that term? Not like? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. No problem. Yeah, ultimately, it's about, you know, you, you're going to measure these things, right? And you have, you're going to be asking yourself, okay, what do I care about? Where, where, where do I want this metric to go? Right. So Hootsuite gives you so much. I mean, it's a flood, right, Claire? Mm -hmm. I mean, this thing is intense. It measures everything. And we at SAI have like all the accounts you can think about in the world, right? <laughs> so it's it's really complex. We have different targets for different audiences, right? When you're in LinkedIn, it's different a little bit to when you're on Twitter. So you you look at that very carefully. I will add another stakeholder to think about. So we in terms of communication, uh, on our one of our on our website, you may have seen this already. We have our annual reports that we post online, right? And so our most recent one is uh, actually hosted via Canva. And the reason why we actually we used to do PDFs now is Canva because then we can measure, right? Canva gives you this ability to just keep track of the number of eyeballs on it, for example, downloads and so forth. So we changed things. I think this this past. Um, cycle to to do that right but that's another communication like content strategy we put that there because we want to share um we want to share this information with our broader stakeholders yeah and so that's yeah um jumping back to this photo um it's kind of where in that second the first tier and second tier of the pyramid where you're not going to do these reports hopefully as often but they are going to take a lot of effort to come in but it's oh so worth it that you do create some sort of report to showcase your effort and your work that you're putting in, especially to your funders. Um, I think all grants right now, FanWell requires some type of report back to whoever you're wow. receiving the uh, money from. I was just working on one uh, this Monday, right? It was due the same day. I was like, oh, I almost forgot, you know? And most of, most of the grants have like a reporting uh, time frame. They want you to do this by so forth. So the, I think this one is probably the most intense we've received, uh, ASCB, where we're on report number five. And it's a one year grant. Okay. <laughs> and we, there's still more due. Okay. But this is where you need to be really diligent, right? You guys are the leaders and founders of these initiatives. Like, I organically want to share, actually, right? And, and to give you another, uh, Claire, so we're doing these videos, right, for our, for our residents, where for those, if they, if they get some internal money from us, the report uh, that we want to see is actually like a video, five minute video summarizing what they're up to, right? So we, we are actually being kind of more responsive than the old traditional uh, granting agencies that want these really complex reports, you know, that hopefully someone reads. I don't know, you know? <laughs> so ultimately, it's about communication and who's reading what. But, okay, well, yeah, you definitely bring up a good point, too. It's especially because, I mean, you all are the creators of these programs. Your time is so valuable and so limited. Um, as you're starting out in this content creation world and um, definitely try to create things that you can use across multiple platforms. Um, so like your reports, uh, you're able to kind of take, you can have this larger report, um, SAI does this, and you can take little snippets of it or shot little like facts um, and use, you can repurpose that and use it as content or social media content or things to talk about in a video. Or if you do like a larger conversation with somebody else, uh, you can break those videos up into short digestible pieces as well and kind of just spew those little like snippets out in different places too. I, I will share one thing that from a previous uh, cohorts that we've heard is a lot of founders, especially in this phase, are really afraid of talking about themselves. So. Claire mentioned earlier, like you should have a website, yeah, for your thing that you're launching, sure, but also maybe consider having a pl like a platform for you, about you, who you are, and why why are you doing this, right? Like the people to, to connect the dots, right? And it's uncomfortable. I'll tell you, I found it really uncomfortable for a really long time when SAI was just like my, I feel like SAI was me, right? But I shouldn't have to tell people about me separately from it, right? but it was actually very critical to do so uh, on that. And so the last batch, I'll, I'll be very frank, the last batch, they challenged me to, first of all, create a, 
uh, domain name with my name, like fayoungwindy.com, right? Very uncomfortable. Like literally, I, I just withheld for a couple of years to create this. And I did eventually, right? So you guys can check it out. It actually is a thing. <laughs> um and the whole goal was to try and just bring all the things different things that i'm doing you know so um this is my it's very simple it's a one pager literally and there's nothing on the site actually just like uh outlinks to something else but but don't be afraid to do that right to talk about yourself as well in this your, your stories are super important um, and you're not alone. And there are, there are a lot of people out there who have experienced semi similar things kind of as what you've gone through and the passion that and drive that you have. And so by, by sharing just who you are, why you are doing what you're doing um, in some portion uh, really helps create trust and kind of open up these doors for empathy and it showcases, it really brings the human side um, to science and outreach and communication. And that's that's really what we're doing is we're connecting science with humans and society. And so always take the, take the initiative. Don't be afraid to talk about yourself. Um, share and disclose as much as you want to, um, but push yourself to do that as well and to be open because the, the minute that you kind of drop your walls down, that cues the person that you're talking with that it's okay that it's okay for them to drop their walls too to be vulnerable right and and so prasha who you guys if you watch the video so prasha sawarte is my goodness she was probably she was maybe the first uh, so the first resident of sai okay and became a board member a trustee and and she's doing phenomenal now she launched her uh, her stem story one of her initial projects she came with at sai we helped her develop it and now she's basically running a full-time business, um, quit her job, and she's doing this, launching, talking about career, women in STEM, right? And building basically an empire around that, right? Um, and it's about being vulnerable, right? And not being afraid to do that. And so I try to, to communicate that in my in my one-on-ones with funders, you know, with uh, team members that I'm trying to recruit. And I keep saying that because you're, part of this is recruitment. You won't be able to do this yourself. You really won't, and uh, nor should you actually, right? It's way more fun working with others actually, way more fun. So, uh, but being vulnerable, saying like, you don't, I don't know everything. Um, I made this mistake. I've, again, you're thinking about what am I trying to communicate here that this is a work in progress. If you join here, you're, you're belie you believe in what we're trying to do and you're, and you're gonna help us, right? Get to this other stage. So yeah, it, it's, it's fun. Other questions do we have? So Claire, should they? So so I think when I was thinking about oh maybe it's about time to have a communications like person you mm -hmm. know officer. Um, that was actually several years right uh, five or six years into SAI. Um, so. Should they do this by themselves for a long time? Or when should they be thinking about, maybe I should bring in a team member to help me out? Or should it be like a cohesive effort by everybody in the team, right? To be communicating what we're doing to the broader stakeholders. It's a, a delicate yeah. transition point. Yes, to all. Um, and kind of the ways to break that up and think about it. Um, you want to be thinking about you yourself um, want to be thinking about your communication strategy and your content and your marketing and branding efforts um, because you are the one that has created this program. You know it the best um, and you have the ability to be creative and think about kind of what your the messages that you're trying to convey um, based on the audiences and stakeholders that you're working with at the moment. Um, and the earlier that you're able to bring somebody else on your team um, or do workshops and office and do your own trainings to enhance your um, communication skills, the better because the further your programs will go because you'll be able to communicate with a multitude of others and gain support, funding and con kind of like contacts um, in the communities. Um, like I'm thinking about like Fanwell, when you brought me on um, a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, we, you were doing a great job of kind of just spreading the word about SAI, trying to get out there. Um, and then 
the first thing I did when I came on is thinking about our larger, taking a look at our values, our mission, our statements, and our kind of the brand of SAI and how we can effectively differentiate ourselves from others um, who are out there in which surprise there weren't there weren't any when we dug down and really like looked into it and did kind of a a, a, com a competitor analysis there wasn't anybody else doing what we were doing and so it was really easy then to communicate why SAI was so important and so valuable and so that's kind of where I, I push you as you're developing this is to think about when you're looking at other competitors, okay, what makes me unique and how can I use that in a content or a communication like strategy format um, when I'm speaking with different groups. Um, and there are also, I, I will put out kind of as you as you grow and build, um, build your programs out, get things up and going, um, do as much as you can communication wise by yourself. Um, and when you're able to take on another team member to help you out, there are so many different avenues, um, internships um, with undergraduates and high school students, um, graduate, other graduate students as well. Um, you all are in the SAI community right now. And so working with um, others who are involved and who have done communication surrounding their projects are great. Um, there are other like content people in the field as well, podcasts um, where you can kind of gain some training and some skills there. Um, but then also too, once you take on those other team members, even if they're not doing communication, if they're doing finance or um, uh, like program management, things like that, ensure that they have the tools in their belt to effectively communicate about your about the program itself too. And so that everybody has a defined kind of way in which how they describe your program um, and where people can go when people ask, oh, how can I get, get more information? They know the response to give where it's, oh, head on over to our website. You'll be able to find our About Us page or follow us on Twitter at blah, blah, blah um, type thing. And so they, they can also take, your team members can take your message and spread it further too. So we're coming up to time. Um, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. And again, this is a, it's a developing thing that like you're gonna have to continue to practice, right? This is a practice you're developing and the, the skills you need to launch these things is always gonna be changing. And so I implore you to seek a growth mindset to say, okay, how can I learn this? How can I be better? I didn't know anything about uh, running Twitter and like literally, right? I was just making it up as I went, right? Before Hootsuite, it was just me posting on Twitter, going to LinkedIn, posting that, because I didn't know there was Hootsuite, right? Nor could we afford it either, but there's like a free version you can plug into. Uh, same thing will come into websites management. I managed our website for like years, right? Years. I've been up at 3 a.m. trying to fix something. Trust me. A lot of fun nights, right? But in that now, like I can say, oh, we have like a firm that's managing our website. Oh my God, I feel so like honored. Like, I, I don't know, it's just crazy to think that, that that was worth it, right? To get it to a stage where I can now say, let's let's have this team because I, I trust in what they can do. And I believe in, okay, this other person can post here because I know that they understand what we're trying to communicate, how we're trying to communicate. Same thing with Claire, like we're in sync, right? We are meeting constantly to we finesse that what are we trying to say to whom where and when and why right the whole five w's that she went over right you're never done you're never ever done the minute you think you're done and settle my pitch deck is finished i'm going to put it away under the next <laughs> no like you gotta go back in there like change something right claire's always hearing me oh we should change this you know <laughs> Uh, edit this, edit that, because this is not right. That you want to have that spirit continuously. Okay. Um, so Claire, thank you so much. Yeah, by all means, I dropped a link to my Calendly. Um, please use that by all means while you're here in the program. If you want to talk about calm and calm strategy and really get individualized attention, feel free to sign up for a meeting with me. Um, and if you see that I am blocked on some certain times um, while y'all are with us, uh, just shoot me an email or, or a Slack message and I will accommodate my schedule. So you all are my priority at this point. I want to make sure that you get the really the attention, um, especially on the comms end of things um, that you deserve. So I, and I also will say, 
I'm in your network by any means at any point in time after you've moved through the program, um, reach out to me. I will connect you with others. I will, I will do what I can. Um, and I just, again, like I'm here for you and I want to see you all succeed. So please tap into me. All right, guys, um, have a great week. Um, logos, don't forget. So this is something about from last cohort. I should just mention this now in the middle. Work on that on the side as well. Okay, look at previous cohorts, what they develop. People come up with really crazy logos. They're a lot of fun. Okay, so I look forward to get the end of the program. We'll get to see these in action. So <laughs> have a great week, everybody. I'll Clean stick and around. Simple. Clean and simple. <laughs> Thank you.